for the next few videos, we're not going to talk about cities or urban issues or anything like that. It's going to be just history, no modern takeaways or analysis, because for once, I deserve a little treat. This year, 2021, is the 50th anniversary of the creation of the publicly owned, for-profit National Railroad Passenger Corporation, the company that we know as Amtrak. On April 30th, 1971, Amtrak eased 392 regularly scheduled passenger train services departed for the final time, marking the end of an era. The next day, Saturday, May 1st, only 174 of those trains would continue operating under Amtrak. But a few trains actually did continue running after the start of Amtrak. And in this short series, I'm going to go through them one by one until we reach the last train in America. The trains we're going to look at are the surviving intercity trains whose railroads opted not to turn them over to Amtrak. And we're going to go in order of when they stopped running. We'll touch on their history, why they chose not to join Amtrak, and how each one met their end. While these are stories of resilience, they're also steeped in decay. Once grand trains reduced the shells of their former selves, hobbling along into a new era. And this era would be marked by an uncertainty over whether or not travel by train even had a future, if Amtrak would pull through, and what would become of the final trains still running on their own. The first train in the series is the Southern Crescent, operated by Southern Railways. Predecessors to the Southern Crescent ran between Washington and Atlanta, and then later all the way to New Orleans. The Crescent name was given to the train in 1925, probably from a combination of its route carving through the southeast in a crescent shape. And the busiest portion of the route between Atlanta and DC was overnight in both directions. The Southern Crescent was regarded as one of Southern Railway's flagship trains and featured luxurious accommodations throughout its life. But by the early 70s, the Southern Crescent was down pretty bad, like pretty much every other train in America. Southern Railways made attempts to keep ridership up they offered a single ticket connecting all the way to New York in conjunction with the Pennsylvania Railroad. They combined other trains with the Southern Crescent as the ridership dwindled, but nothing stemmed the bleeding. Like a lot of other trains, one of the final blows was the U.S. Postal Service canceling its contract with Southern Railways to haul mail on the Crescent. And after that, the finances of the route entered into a free fall. But railroads couldn't just give up and abandon their routes. To stop running a train, a railroad had to petition the Interstate Commerce Commission. In 1970, the federal government offered a way out for the railroads who couldn't get rid of their money passenger train fast enough. This video isn't about the formation of Amtrak, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. You're going to have to finish your main course somewhere else. This one's all dessert. Basically, any railroad that was operating passenger service could get out of its obligations by turning over the route to Amtrak, along with either cash or equipment. If they chose not to join, the railroads would be obligated to operate their routes until 1975, when they would have to go through the traditional petition process. Regardless, in early 1971, Southern Railways announced that it would not be joining Amtrak and would keep operating the Southern Crescent, along with some of its connecting services. So why did Southern choose to go it alone? The stated reason was that the railroad felt it would be cheaper to keep operating the train than to put up the funds to turn it over to Amtrak. I don't think that was the entire reason though. The president of Southern Railways, W. Graham Clater Jr., was in fact a rail fan. Okay, maybe not like a true rail fan, but it does seem that Clater genuinely did love trains, which is really rare for a railroad president. Like most railroad presidents hate trains more than anything. Okay, like 
here he is leading a fan trip on the Southern Crescent in the 60s. This is not normal railroad president stuff. This is like real phone or shit. Claytor would go on to serve as Secretary of Transportation under Carter and then lead Amtrak through the 1980s. So anyway, Claytor kept Southern flagship service and ordered that the engines on the train be repainted in the railroad's signature green and gold to mark Southern Railway's renewed commitment to providing its passengers with luxury service. With that, the Crescent kept going alongside its supporting trains, the Piedmont, which was a more humble daytime counterpart to the Southern Crescent, the Birmingham Special, which provided additional service between Washington and Lynchburg, Virginia, nowhere close to Birmingham, and the Asheville Special, which made a connection with the Crescent to reach Asheville, North Carolina. The main feature, of course, was the Southern Crescent which ran daily to Atlanta and then three times a week to New Orleans. Despite not joining Amtrak, Southern Railways did integrate its trains into the system. Amtrak operated the Crescent between New York and Washington, where it was handed over to Southern. Amtrak sleeper cars were attached onto the Southern Crescent on the days that it ran to New Orleans, which enabled passengers to ride through to Los Angeles. By all accounts, the Southern Crescent remained an enigma of luxury service, at a time when Amtrak was just getting its feet. The sort of white glove service that riders had expected for decades continued, and contemporary descriptions include private showers in master bedroom suites, dining cars with white tablecloths and sterling silver, and decorated with fresh cut flowers. Despite all of this though, the forces that ended private rail service in 1971 continued to work against the Southern Crescent throughout the decade. Ridership on the Southern Crescent never took off again, and Southern Railways started to cut its losses. Starting in 1975, Southern Railways was allowed to discontinue services that it didn't hand over to Amtrak, and it did. The first cut in early 1975 was the paradoxically named Birmingham Special that made a trip between Washington and Lynchburg, Virginia, which was often just a single engine and car stuck on the back of a freight train. Following that, the Asheville Special was discontinued in August 1975, and finally the Piedmont, the Crescent's daytime counterpart, was cut back to Charlotte, North Carolina, and then discontinued entirely in late 1976. In 1978, the Southern Crescent was losing $6 million annually, and Southern Railways filed to discontinue its last train. The odds were always stacked against it. Amtrak's creation was designed to offload the burden of passenger services to save freight railroads, and unlike Amtrak, there was no public subsidy given to Southern Railways. The intent all along was that these railroads were supposed to hand over their trains in 1971. W. Graham Claytor, rail fan king, president, who had kept the Southern Crescent running as an act of goodwill, had left and was replaced by a president who did not share the same feelings. At the same time, the railroad entered into negotiations with Amtrak to transfer ownership of the Crescent. Southern Railways attempted at first to make Amtrak the same offer it did in 1971, about $7 million with 4 million of that made up of engines and passenger cars. The Crescent had been involved in a bunch of derailments and collisions in the 70s, so the equipment was probably beat to hell, and not even to mention it was all built in the 1940s. So Amtrak might have been okay with getting some crappy trains in 1971, but by 1978, they were buying new trains and wanted cold hard cash instead. Eventually, an agreement was reached with Southern Railways, paying Amtrak the entire sum in cash, and on February 1st, 1979, the Southern Crescent was handed over, making it our first train down. The Southern Crescent lost its luxury status and became simply the Crescent. Amtrak rented the old trains to use for a couple months, and during that time, rail fans stole all of the silverware so if your rail fan dad has some 
you know, forks or knives or plates with Southern Crescent logos. That's where we got them. Amtrak did start it out strong though. The inaugural trip featured a musical, two pianists, an impromptu singing performance by one of the train attendants that was met to such acclaim that she did several encores, and the top marching band in New Orleans greeted the train arriving from New York. Shortly after the takeover, though, the Crescent was in danger of being completely discontinued. A budget report recommended cutting the route as soon as the funds from Southern Railways to operate the train ran out later in 1979. A gas shortage that same year, though, spiked ridership on Amtrak and helped save a bunch of routes. And so since then, the Crescent has continued its nightly run while slowly building up ridership from its low point at 165,000 annual riders in the late 1970s to just under 300,000 in 2019. The only major change in keeping with our theme of decay is that this year Amtrak added two hours of padding to the Crescent's schedule to accommodate recurring delays caused by freight traffic interference. And with that, we have our first last train in America. The train kept alive by sheer will of one rail fan with the power of an entire railroad at its beck and call. It survived just eight years, and we don't really have long to go until the next survivors topple either. So come back soon for part two of Last Train in America.